All right. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, so Isaiah 56 that we did last time was when God is speaking of the uh, new covenant that he's making, and it includes these people that previously we didn't know God was going to include among his people. So we talked about the foreigners and the eunuchs, and then at the end of chapter 56 was his rebuke uh, against uh, the leaders of Judah because uh, they had followed their own pleasures and their own self-gratification rather than God's word. So, a fairly, uh, I wouldn't want to say standard, but a pretty standard chapter in Isaiah in that sense. So, that's right. That's how it gets. God's two words. So, all right, Isaiah 57 today. The righteous man perishes and no one lays it to heart. Devout men are taken away while no one understands. For the righteous man is taken away from calamity. He enters into peace. They rest in their beds who walk in their uprightness. Now these two verses uh, are kind of distinct from the rest of the chapter. Uh, I think you could include them really at the end of chapter 6. Uh, I'm sorry, 56. But uh, there, there's a comment on the fact that uh, the righteous do perish and nobody cares. And uh, while it's not an explicit connection. I think there might be a connection here between what we've heard this far about uh, the suffering servant, because he is the righteous one, and God actually does give him that title. He calls him my righteous one. And they don't understand uh, the taking away and the death of the suffering servant, uh, that uh, we esteemed him not, or we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, even though he's actually come to do God's will. Uh, but this is true of the righteous in general. Uh, what the wicked also don't understand, at the end of verse 1, the righteous man is taken away from calamity. He enters into peace. They rest in their beds who walk in their uprightness. So, uh, throughout the scripture, uh, and I, I tend to agree that uh, sleep, resting in your bed, is a wonderful blessing from God. <laughs> And depending on your stage in life, you might not enjoy it as much, uh, <laughs> simply because you don't get as much, which That's I could nice. identify with that. Uh, but uh, we know that uh, sleep also in the scriptures, and we see especially in the New Testament, uh, that uh, sleep is also the Christian death, uh, that uh, we rest in the grave in anticipation of the resurrection. And uh, even though our intermediate state is not everything that it will be, in the resurrection with Christ. Nevertheless, we do rest in peace with him. And St. Paul says, it is uh, better to be away from the body and to be in the presence of the Lord because we're with Christ. And throughout the scriptures, that we kind of see that, especially in the Psalms. Psalm 4, in peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. He gives to his beloved sleep in Psalm 127. And uh, you know, somebody made the comment one time that sleep is uh, the closest that we get to death uh, while we're alive. Uh, because obviously you're unaware, hopefully you're unaware, you get a good night's sleep. Uh, and it's also true that uh, we're at our most vulnerable when we sleep. Um, that, uh, you know, it could be, there you are, you're welcome, Carol. Um, I mean, any, any number of really horrible things could happen to you <laughs> while you're asleep. And uh, it is a, it's a testimony to, to God's protection and his, uh, his faithfulness that he watches over us while we sleep. Uh, and so I think that's the connection to that um, what he gives to his beloved, he gives them peace in their sleep. 
Uh, he gives us peace as we await the resurrection of the dead. Um, this hymn is an evening hymn, uh, number 883. Uh, what is it? All praise to thee, my God, this night. And I love this stanza. Teach me to live that I may dread the grave as little as my bed. So I certainly do not dread my bed. Uh, and that's, that's our hope for a Christian death, too. Uh, teach me to die so that I may rise glorious at the awful day. Uh, and that's the, the peace, the resting in the bed, I think that he's talking about. <clears throat> not just the bed that you lay down at night uh, and to go to sleep, but it's the bed that we make at our grave. Uh, and uh, because of the righteous one that God sends, then we do have that peace. So that those two verses, though, at the beginning of 57 are distinct, really, from what follows in the rest of the chapter. So verse 3, in contrast to that, but you draw near, sons of the sorceress, offspring of the adulterer and the loose woman. Whom are you mocking? Against whom do you open your mouth wide and stick out your tongue? Are you not children of transgression, the offspring of deceit? You who burn with lust among the oaks under every green tree, who slaughter your children in the valleys under the clefts of the rocks. Among the smooth stones of the valley is your portion. They, they are your lot. To them you have poured out a drink offering. You have brought a grain offering. Shall I relent for these things? So we'll stop right there. So we hear uh, this pretty sharp rebuke. <clears throat> Sorry about the voice this morning. You sons of the sorceress, offspring of the adulterer. I, I gave you, see it's not my words, so I can't get into trouble, but uh, Luther paraphrases it very nicely in his commentary on Isaiah. He says, you children of whores and witches. <laughs> no, not, not to put, you know, too fine a point on it. But uh, there, there is a marked contract. Of course, you don't want to be the son of a witch or a sorcerer or an adulterous woman. Uh, but uh, this is one of the more lurid pictures of unfaithfulness that God gives, especially in the Old Testament. That uh, unfaithfulness to God is spiritual adultery. And uh, the adultery is the key because... Um, Adultery, while, while they are in the same family, adultery is not the same thing as just good old-fashioned fornication. Adultery is actually, I have been married, I have been committed, and then I adulterate my relationship by mixing in somebody else in this case. And so uh, that, that's a harsher rebuke than simply, you're in sin, you're immoral, but it is, you were married, and now you've committed adultery. Isaiah begins that way as well. One of the first things he says, his rebukes in chapter one, he says how the faithful city, Jerusalem, has become a whore, she who is full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. So, and all of the prophets, Ezekiel's got some really graphic imagery about what it means uh, and how he pictures uh, Israel as committing that kind of adultery. So, and then he details uh, some of these adulterous practices, uh, which he mentioned in verse 5. Uh, you who burn with lust among the oaks under every green tree, who slaughter your children in the valleys under the clefts of the rocks. Now, uh, during Isaiah's ministry, we know that he prophesied during the reign of many kings. And I'm trying to think, is it six? Might be. Begins with King Uzziah. Uh, but at one point, we did hear a little bit about Ahaz, and Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good king. Uh, Ahaz, not so much. And uh, he actually uh, gives the people of Judah a bad example uh, because he does engage in a lot of these idolatrous practices. And uh, it says in 2 Kings that Ahaz, who we already know is wicked, even burned his son, not Hezekiah, another one, as an offering according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. 
So there, there's the same illusion that Isaiah has, that uh, he says you burn with lust under every green tree. And then uh, the slaughtering your children is the burning of Ahaz's son. Uh, the people who worship the god Moloch, who was one of the Canaanite gods, uh, their sites of worship were many times under these trees. Uh, or they could be in the high places, which is uh, a burr in uh, God's boot uh, throughout the Old Testament because depending on the king, sometimes the king will tear down the high place, sometimes he leaves them and tolerates them. But these are the sites of worship uh, for the false gods. So, uh, there, and it might have been because some of these gods, you know, had a fertility cult surrounding them, that there was some actual literal sexual immorality immorality that went on. Uh, but the other thing was that Moloch especially, um, they would sacrifice their own children as part of his worship. And Ahaz doesn't even spare his own son. So uh, this is in part uh, what Judah is being rebuked for here. So he says, uh, verse 7, Actually, sorry, no, verse 6. Among the smooth stones of the valley is your portion. They, they are your lot. To them you have poured out a drink offering. You have brought a grain offering. So these sacrifices are occurring. Obviously not the sacrifices that God has instituted. And then, on the other hand, uh, they're not in the place that he has called them to. They've gone to these mountains. They've gone to the trees, uh, to the clefts and the rocks of the valley. But uh, God, as we know in Isaiah, dwells in his temple. So they have done everything contrary uh, to what it is that God had commanded them to do. Where they have gone instead, verse 7, On a high and lofty mountain you have set your bed, and there you went up to offer sacrifice. So up on these mountains, and then behind the door and the doorpost you have set up your memorial. For deserting me you have uncovered your bed, you have gone up to it, you have made it wide, and you have made a covenant for yourself with them. You have loved their bed. You looked on nakedness. So they've taken their idolatrous worship, not only under the trees and the mountains, but he says behind the door and the doorpost. In other words, they brought it into their house. Yeah, into their home. And uh, he's extending the metaphor, uh, the, the sexual immorality metaphor. You've uncovered your bed. You've made your own covenant. See, this is not a good idea. You let God make the covenant. You enter God's covenant. But he says in 8, you have loved their bed. You have looked on nakedness. And uh, where was it? You've made it wide. <laughs> in other words, plenty of room for anybody, you know, who comes in. And uh, again, that's, uh, that's his, the imagery of the unfaithfulness. Uh, that they, they have cheated on God. And they've not just... Uh, not just for one guy, uh, but for, for many, because they've made the bed wide. They've done some other things, too, that are kind of on par with this, that you see in verse 9. You journeyed to the king with oil and multiplied your perfumes. You sent your envoys far off and sent down even to Sheol. You were wearied with the length of your way, but you did not say it is hopeless. You found new life for your strength, and so you were not faint. So they have journeyed to the king, and this might be an allusion to something that we heard about uh, earlier in Isaiah, especially, I think it was Isaiah 31, when uh, with the impending crisis of the Assyrians coming in Sennacherib, uh, the people of Judah decide there's no way we can stand up to him. They see what happens with the northern kingdom, uh, that they're permanently uh, displaced by Assyria. So instead of turning to God, what they do is they say, well, let's make an alliance with the Egyptians. So uh, God devotes several chapters, as I recall, uh, to rebuking them for that. He says, woe to those who go down to Egypt, because you are trusting once again in alliances and politics and chariots and horses. You cannot do this. Uh, and if you do it, what, what we're really doing is you are keeping yourself from considering God's word, from hearing the prophet, from repenting. And this band-aid that you're going to put on it, you're going to find out the Egyptians are not that impressive. And God knows this already. He's known this for a long time. Foolish. 
And yeah. Could, like make them all cooler. Yes. Like, you're running around in circles, and <laughs> they weren't gonna be there. Mm -hmm. So. And they're the the bruised reed. You know, it's a reed in the wind. It's gonna break. It's not not what you think it is. Uh, so that this could be a reference then to that. It's not explicit, but you went to the king, and you took all of your gifts, all of your tributes uh, that you see in verse nine. Uh, you took the oil, the perfumes, you sent your, your messengers, your ambassadors, um, even down to Sheol, to the grave. So, anywhere except to God himself. Verse 11. Whom did you dread and fear, so that you lied and did not remember me, did not lay it to heart? Have I not held my peace even for a long time and you do not fear me? They dreaded and feared pretty much everybody else uh, other than God himself. Uh, this is a first commandment violation, so you can see where all their other problems come from. Uh, and God says, you know, I've held my peace, which he hasn't spoken his word of judgment. He hasn't condemned. He hasn't rebuked. Uh, God has waited. and." Uh, even this, uh, they didn't lay to heart. Uh, you would actually think they're kind of disturbed by the fact God has not said anything. I wonder what he's planning. Uh, hopefully God is not withdrawing from us, but instead they just kind of use this as license to go ahead and I'm, do what I'm going to do. So, verse 12. <coughs> I will declare your righteousness and your deeds so-called, but they will not profit you. And when you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. The wind will carry them all off, a breath will take them away. But he who takes refuge in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. So, uh, you can stack up your gods, you know, the Buddha and everything else, and uh, you let that block of wood save you. Uh, we've heard a lot in Isaiah about the futility of idolatry, the, the utter ridiculousness of the guy goes into the woods, he cuts down the tree, he builds his little fire, he makes, you know, his idol, he gilds it with gold, and then he says, this is the thing, you know, that's made everything, this thing I just made, you know, and he uses the rest of the wood, you know, to cook his dinner and things. So uh, God says, go ahead, let your collection of idols save you. Uh, and, and they're, they're next to nothing. It's not just that they'll rust and fall apart, but they, they are so vapid that the wind will carry them away. A breath will take them away. Uh, but he keeps that promise that whoever trusts in me, he will inherit my holy mountain. Uh, the mountain that we saw in Isaiah 25, uh, which we've mentioned several times now, but uh, where God will gather his true people, the place where he wants to be worshipped, not under green trees and all of these places, but, but the mountain that he ordains, he will be a refuge to them there. Okay, anything about that first section? Okay, well then beginning with verse 14, we go back to a, a major theme here at the end of Isaiah, which is comfort. And it shall be said, build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstruction from my people's way. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Okay, and you know who says, prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And we saw that earlier, I think the first time is Isaiah 40. And that's where God says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God, your warfare is ended. And he has forgiven them doubly for their sins. And then he says, the voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. We know that that is fulfilled ultimately in John the Baptist. And all three, I'm sorry, all four of uh, the Gospels explicitly make this connection, which tells you that it is mighty important. Uh, there's very few things, uh, apart from like Jesus' death and resurrection, that are in all four Gospels. Uh, but the ministry of John the Baptist and the way that he acts as the forerunner 
to prepare the way of the Lord is one of them. And they always quote Isaiah 40, the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And so we see it recur again also throughout Isaiah. And you see here that uh, the, the way that he says in Isaiah 40 is prepare the way of the Lord. What he says here, though, the, the emphasis in 14 is prepare the way, remove every obstacle from my people's way. So not just the way of the Lord as he comes, but the way of my people. Uh, and I think that that shows us that what he's talking about is not it's not the literal what Isaiah says. Every mountain shall be lifted up. Every valley and hill be brought low. Actually, the other way around, right? Yeah, make the straight highway. The idea is clear the way, uh, but uh, what he's saying here is that clear my people's way. And I think that's a call to repentance, that all of the obstacles and the things that we erect, these are the things that need to be taken away so that my people's way to the Lord is also prepared. And there's a, there's a beautiful contrast in 15. Thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. All right, and that's a wonderful description of the glory of God. Uh, repeatedly, God in Isaiah is called high and lifted up. When Isaiah in chapter 6 begins his prophetic ministry, he's there in the temple, and he says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, train of his robe filled the temple, and the seraphim are encircling the throne. Uh, so, the, the exalted one, the one who transcends all of these things, who reigns over everything, this is the one who is speaking. And he inhabits eternity. And his name is holy. And the translator has shown you, he doesn't mean that his name is kept holy, the way that we are to do per the second commandment and the first petition of the Lord's Prayer. But he means, no, his name is, the guy's name is holy. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and that's what the seraphim cry out continually, unceasingly. Which is why you should always sing the song to us in church. No, no good reason to get rid of it. <laughs> that's the eternal song of the angels. That they forever encircle the throne. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. God himself doesn't. He doesn't have holiness as an attribute. You know, you and I can be holy in Christ. God, God is holiness itself. And this is what they proclaim about him, that he is holy, holy, holy. This God who reigns over all things, who is holiness itself, who inhabits eternity. He says, I dwell in the high and holy place. And the same God, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. The places that God dwells are in his glory, in his high and holy place and with people who repent of their sin, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. And God says many similar things throughout the scriptures like this. Psalm 51, which is a great penitential psalm. And David, after he's confessed his sin of uh, committing adultery with Bathsheba, he says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And so there is the contrition uh, that he mentions in Isaiah, that exactly what God wants is a broken and pulverized heart and a spirit, that this is his favorite place to dwell. The same God who's encircled by the seraphim, who reigns forever, who's uh, high and enthroned in majesty. Uh, not only does he not despise a contrite heart, he loves a contrite heart. Uh, this is how God does his best work when he reduces you to nothing and breaks you down. And then he's like, this is the place I want to live. Uh, yeah, and then he builds us up, right? And we've heard this this past several weeks from Jesus uh, when he says that the Father and the Spirit, we, we will come and we'll make our home with him. Uh, that's the kind of home that he wants. There was one other that this passage especially made me think of, Psalm 138. For the Lord is high, he reigns over all things. He regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. So there is that lowly and contrite spirit uh, that, that God uses 
the unlikeliest and the least and the nothings and the nobodies to accomplish his will. And the great thing about being nothing is that since there's nowhere else to go, then we actually turn to God. You know, by his grace, it's something that he accomplishes. Uh, but, but this is why he dwells with the lowly. Uh, the lowly actually know their place. They know that they're nothing and they know that they're undone. And Isaiah personally has that sense too, because when he sees that great vision of God in Isaiah chapter six, uh, he doesn't go, well, I'm, I'm really quite fortunate, you know, to have seen this, but he says, woe is me, because I'm lost, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And he knows, and we've been talking about this on Wednesday mornings, uh, to see God is certain death. And so Isaiah is about to have his lifetime limit. Like he's about to have the lifetime limit of chemo. Like he's looking in the nuclear reactor and he knows that he will die. But for the fact that God sends the seraph who touches the burning coal to his lips. And he says, your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. And I'd like to think that Isaiah went around with the bird on his mouth the rest of his life. It doesn't say that, but... Um, but God accepts the lowly and the contrite heart that Isaiah has. So, anything about that? I feel like I've been blitzing today, but. All right, well, and part of that is my own tardiness, so I apologize, but. Okay, a few more verses. 16. For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry. For the spirit would grow faint before me and the breath of life that I made. So this is good news for you and me. Uh, God is not angry forever. He's not wrathful forever. Uh, and this is something that, again, the psalmist says, Psalm 30, his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. And God gives you an explanation in Isaiah as to why this is. Because if God continually was unrelenting in his anger, there would be nothing left. <laughs> you know, there would be nobody to be angry about. Everything would return, I suppose, to non-being. Uh, so I will not contend forever. I will not always be angry because everybody would wither. The spirit would grow faint, the breath of life that I made. Uh, and we also know why does his anger relent? Because of his steadfast love and his compassion uh, that he gives to us in Christ. 17. Now he was angry though, because of the iniquity of his unjust gain, I was angry. I struck him, I hid my face and was angry, but he went on backsliding in the way of his own heart. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and his mourners, creating the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to the near and to the, to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. All right. So you see, beginning with 18 through 21, uh, many times what we have, and Isaiah is a good example of this, there's a clear delineation between the people that God is condemning and rebuking, and then there's the faithful. You and I know in our own experience uh, that uh, from a human point of view, we are a mix of both of these things. Uh, that sometimes we, we need to hear the rebukes against faithless Judah, and at other times we need to hear the comfort. But this passage, I think, is kind of unique in that the man is both. So he's rebuked the man, rebuked the man. And then right in the middle of the sentence in 18, I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. All right, and, and you can see the miracle then of conversion and uh, what God does with the lowly and the contrite heart, uh, that uh, he does restore his people. I will lead him and restore him, comfort him and his mourners, and he says he will create the fruit of the lips. We pray uh, also Psalm 51, but uh, like when we, when we have Vespers here in Advent, the opening versicles are, from the psalm, O oh Lord, open my lips, my mouth will declare your praise. And unless God opens the lips, then we would not do it. We wouldn't call upon him in prayer and praise. We wouldn't call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. 
uh, but in order for us to rightly confess. Then God works first in the heart, right? This is what St. Paul says. With the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Yes, sir. Is that because I can't remember my own that's the one yeah yeah that, that he creates the fruit now isaiah he talks and at least in a couple of places about the lips and one of the and jesus quotes this remember when jesus in mark 7 he gets upset about the uh, the pharisees and they're clinging to their traditions and don't have any backing from god's word uh he says he quotes isaiah jesus does and he says this people worships me with their lips but their heart is far from them so there's that disconnect uh, but here as he redeems he gives faith then he also creates the fruit of the lips uh, and then we've gone back to that peace that he's mentioned before uh, that there is peace to God's people but the way that he ends there is no peace says my God for the wicked so I think is where uh, no rest for the wicked comes from uh, we, we started with that rest and the peace that God gives, uh, but uh, the wicked are like, uh, they're tossed to and fro uh, like the waves on the sea. Okay, so any anything you thought about with our little jaunt through Isaiah 57? Try to be more on time next week, but... We had little Father's Day things to do, you know, so... Uh, so anyway, all right, well then let us close with the word of prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, uh, we confess that you are holy, that you are enthroned, high and lifted up and exalted. And yet we thank and praise you uh, that though we are unworthy sinners, that uh, you have descended from your throne in the person of your Son, Jesus, our Savior. We thank you that you have taken away our guilt, that you have atoned for our sin. We thank you that uh, by your work, uh, you do give us lowly and contrite hearts, that you uh, give to us also faith and trust. You give to us the fulfillment of every promise that your prophets foresaw. We pray as we enter into your house, uh, as we gather around your throne and join with the angels and the saints in your eternal praise, uh, that you would give to us all of the fruits of Jesus' cross, that you would by your word and sacrament strengthen our faith and our life in you. Assure us, as you did Isaiah, of the full forgiveness of all of our sins, and keep us as your own now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you.